Hey everyone, welcome to finals week. Um, I, I was just talking with some people right before I started recording here and, and I do want to kind of reiterate um, how much I, I want to be here as a helpful support and resource to you as you're trying to finish everything up. Um, if there's any, anything I can be doing or what I can be doing, let me know how I can help you. Um, we've got a few things uh, happening this week. Um, I thought I could start today by just doing a, another quick rundown of it all. I, I tried to put everything in the weekend update email, but um, maybe it'd be helpful to, to get some reminders about things, and then and then we'll get on to some Nietzsche, um, which is uh, the main plan. Try to do what we can. Uh, like I said in the weekend update email, I really do want to save our last class for Falk, um, so our Friday session. Some people were confused about the mandatoriness. Um, that is not uh, the... Having mandatory class today was not meant to suggest anything about how you have to be on campus. We're, that's definitely not happening. Um, so, uh, but the the class uh, it was to just contrast things with Friday's class, which is an extra credit thing. So that's optional. Um, if you show up, I will be giving you, and, and I'll have the video recording. We'll, we'll do all the usual thing. If you can show up live, that's great. But um, I will be recording it as well. And and uh, if you watch the video, if you show up um, there will be extra credit attendance for that and it will be a two-hour session so uh, you'll get two points of extra credit for that um, but our plan is to try to at least do a little bit with Nietzsche today um, I hope that people who are here in chat are prepared to to handle um, directing or that you've got some ideas of what stuff from Nietzsche you'd like to talk about so we can use our time the most productively um, I'll, I can say some general things about Nietzsche's philosophy and I think even just Nietzsche himself is a kind of object lesson in some some stuff in philosophy, so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but you've got um, final drafts for your paper due for me on Friday. Um, I I don't know. I'm going to be trying to get the response papers graded this week to set myself up for success with having to turn around all the final grades in three days after Friday hits. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when that will happen, though. I have some other urgent grading priorities that are that have to come first um, for my critical reasoning students especially but I, I think I'll start getting to grading those tomorrow um, but if you want to get a hold of me to talk about revisions for your final draft um, tomorrow is student success day and I will be creating a Skype link just like normal um, and uh, I'll be just available for drop-in basically 9.30 to 1.30. I'll be here, and if anyone wants to drop in and talk to me, you're welcome to. Um, but you can also get a hold of me through phone calls and emailing and all the rest of that. Um, so I was hearing something. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, so uh, definitely reach out if, if there's anything I can do to help you with this. Revisions for the final draft are really important. Um, they're a big part of how I'm, I'm grading you. Uh, to, you know, you got your first stab at it with the outline and got some feedback and what you can do to modify your paper and, and you know, bump it up to the next level of quality. That's what we're looking for. Um, yes, and I uh, graded it, Nathan, and I actually record some comments for you, and they, uh, they're they posted on the Canvas assignment, so you can find a YouTube link. If you can't find it, let me know. Cheers. Um, any other questions people have in chat about what's going on? Oh, there was something else I wanted to talk about early on here. So um, I don't I don't mean to get too, like, complainy or anything, but... I did notice on uh, YouTube analytics, it reported that on my recent videos, the average viewing length has been seven and a half minutes. And there's a lot of reasons why those numbers could be skewed a little bit, so it doesn't speak totally straightforwardly. But it, it's a, some indication that maybe um, my video lectures have not been watched in their entirety. And um, I, I'm not going to do anything about it, but just other than to indicate that I, I hope you do watch them and I, I hope they're valuable. I mean, it's part of just getting the most out of the class and and um, taking advantage of all the opportunities. So even if you, like, didn't really watch them and just put in the code to get the attendance credit, it, let's just say that happened. Uh, probably not anyone who's in chat right now. I'm probably preaching to the choir here. But um, if you were in that boat, maybe watch them after the quarter's over. I, I hope that they have actual authentic value to you and... 
um, end up being interesting and in, insightful and you know valuable. So just want to say something quick about that. Um, yeah, anyone in chat have any any questions about what's going on this week? No. All right, cool, awesome. Oh, and and the the optional class on Friday uh, with the extra credit attendance is also supplemented with extra credit reading comments and an extra credit journal opportunity in case you want to avail yourself of those. They're, those are available and they'll be available through Friday. Okay, um, let's talk about Nietzsche. Um, uh, how many? Uh, maybe I can just get a quick thing from the chat. How many people here have some passages from Nietzsche to talk about or questions you've got, uh, things that you're curious about? Like a show of hands through the chat. Anyone got anything on deck? A little bit, okay. Anybody else? Just hearing from you, Bernadette. <laughs> I just kind of want to know what I'm working with this morning. Nobody else. Oh, cool. Thank you for having this set up. Okay. Um, what do you mean by desires of uncertainty? I, I, we can talk about the higher and lower human beings whole thing and Nietzsche's elitism. That's definitely a, a major thing. Um, oh, with the you, in the first aphorism. Okay, see if you can find the, the exact spot there. Um, but uh, yeah, I can definitely talk about the general themes that you're bringing up. Um, but, but before I, I just dive into something like that, let me give you a little bit of some background with Nietzsche. Um, Nietzsche is probably the best example of something I put into the curriculum this quarter that I don't agree with. Of <laughs> like I don't I said I I don't necessarily give you readings because I agree with them. Nietzsche is a prime example. I mean he he's sort of like represents everything I'm against <laughs> in some ways. I mean, it just goes down the list of everything. His um, deep skepticism of rationality as being the like main way to go about decision making, even contrary to some of the explicit comments that he makes, we can, we can talk about this a little bit. Um, his elitism and anti-egalitarianism, this uh, way in which he thinks some people, like most people, most human beings aren't worth anything. And we don't, we don't, we shouldn't be concerned about justice with respect to them. I mean, really stark stuff. Um, like I was describing with last week's lecture, Nietzsche's, he's not amoral, but he's definitely a, someone who's playing the moral game and making judgments in that sphere, in that logical sphere, that are not the conventional moral sort of stuff. He's definitely in that camp. He's a, strong polemic voice against traditional morality, con conceptions of morality, which I support. <laughs> I'm all for justice and compassion, and Nietzsche's like adamantly opposed to them. Um, he's got very special criticism. Um, he, it's a lot of this pretty, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, acidic, almost like a, he's got a, he's got a lot of pretty, choice words, let's put it that way, 
for Christianity and Buddhism, which I both identify as. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, and just his like, um, general pessimism about the history of philosophy and where discussions have gone. I mean, he, he, and his, his restore, his rhetorical stylings too, that he's not about being upfront and, uh, transparent, but he is sneaky and tries to manipulate the reader actively. And that's one of the reasons why I left Nietzsche toward the end here, is that reading Nietzsche requires you to be on your critical game. You can't take things just at face value with him. He is, he, and he says as much in his later writings, like toward the end of his life, about he sort of pulls back the curtain a little bit on, on what he's been up to with his philosophical career. And he like openly admits to intentionally manipulating uh, the audience of his writings for certain objectives. So the, the whole approach and methodology, some of his substantive positions, his, definitely his views on ethics, um, I'm like completely opposed to. And I'm not saying you need to be on my side of this or something too, or that um, you know there's a debate to be had here for a reason. And that's part of the reason for taking a look at Nietzsche, that uh, the kind of object lesson I was referring to earlier is how there can be incredible uh, benefit that can come from engaging seriously with someone you deeply disagree with. Uh, Nietzsche is one of the philosophers that I've spent the most time with in my studies as a student of philosophy. I had an undergrad advisor who was like a Nietzsche scholar and spent a bunch of time with him in grad school too, um, usually actually having to in some ways defend his relevance. That, that's been part of this, the story with Western philosophy and Nietzsche. I mean, up until mid 20th century, Nietzsche was just dismissed as being not worth our time. Um, and still people feel that way. Some, some people feel that way about him today. So in some ways I have to kind of like give some defense of like, why even study this dude? Um, I'm, I kind of wonder, I've, when I've talked to students in past quarters about what their impressions are of Nietzsche or whether he sounds familiar. Um, I think that there's a lot of um, sort of uh, low quality Nietzsche clones that run around in our public discourse today. Um, some people that might fancy themselves as being similar to Nietzsche in spirit or style, um, but are maybe not as worth dealing with. Like there's, there's a whole brand of, I might call trolls, <laughs> who kind of have Nietzschean perspectives. Uh, or who share or overlap with some of Nietzsche's views, especially in terms of like a very sort of cynical position about power and how power is the most important thing in the world. Um, Nietzsche thinks everything comes down to will to power um, and, and discredits and dismisses other sorts of values like even truth-seeking or um, compassion or justice or things like that. So I, I kind of anticipate that at least some of you will when you're reading Nietzsche, you might have been like, yeah, I kind of heard some stuff like this before. And certainly his style of writing maybe sounds a little familiar as well. It's very antagonistic. Uh, it's, it's really heavy on the rhetoric. Um, it's not just about putting out the ideas. And you have to really sometimes unpack what's being said to figure out what what's really the argument here. Like, what are the reasons? What is being argued for, for one thing, mm -hmm. is somewhat unclear. And then also, like, how um, how the rationale is supposed to actually look. I mean, Nietzsche is, um, I think it's fair to say, Nietzsche is a very talented writer, almost, almost a poet. Um, people that study German literature, and like, especially if people like translate it and stuff, Nietzsche is considered one of the masters of the German language, just in terms of how he's able to articulate himself and and while the translations that you're getting um, are not you know they don't tell you everything these translations are pretty pretty good um, there was a so I was mentioning how Nietzsche was dismissed for a long time in Western philosophy is just like not worth paying attention to some of it was a association with Nietzschean ideas and the Nazis and German fascists and nationalists which definitely happened um, there are some of Nietzsche's ideas might sound like they they kind of fit together with that, um, but Nietzsche isn't a fascist. He's not a Nazi. <laughs> In fact, he thinks nationalism is one of the stupidest things that's ever 
existed, specifically German nationalism in his writings. I mean, he's writing in the 19th century, so definitely this is before World War II, even World War I, but you definitely have the seeds of German nationalism happening in Nietzsche's time, and then they blossom, they germinate into what we see in World War One and Two, especially World War II. Uh, but you had like Nazi officers walking around with Nietzsche in their pocket, stuff like that. And Nietzsche's own sister, uh, toward the end of his life, when Nietzsche was bedridden with syphilis, uh, which we don't think he contracted sexually. Um, there's a whole other story about that. But um, Nietzsche did. He had he had syphilis, and he was bedridden toward the end of his life. And he had all these unpublished writings. And his sister was a big proponent of German nationalism. She was like an activist for German nationalism, and she was like selectively publishing his works to try to feed into that political agenda. And <clears throat> Nietzsche was just pissed about this. Um, he couldn't really do anything about it. Um, but so he, especially after World War II, there's a big stigma around Nietzsche in Western philosophy. And it took a, a Jewish philosopher named Walter Kaufman to do a bunch of new translations of Nietzsche into English and to really make the argument that Nietzsche is not a Nazi, that this is not this is a misunderstanding, a misconstrual of his philosophy. Um, he might still be wrong, but not wrong on, on he's not he's not to be associated with that. Um, there's a Jewish philosopher who's making these arguments. Kaufman had probably single handedly opened Nietzsche back up in in the philosophical curriculum of like, hey, there's actually some stuff to get into here. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little all over the place. There's a lot of things to say about introducing Nietzsche, but uh, one other connection I want to go back to is I was saying there's these like Nietzsche and copycats or people that write in his sort of style that <clears throat> it isn't all just the logic, it isn't all just the arguments splayed out for you. I will be defending this thesis. Here are my arguments. Here are my the objections. Here are the replies. You know, it's not, it's not that transparent. There's a lot more poetry. There's a lot more color. You might have noticed, like, reading Nietzsche was totally different than anything else that we have been reading this quarter. Um, that is an advantage in some ways. I mean, there, there could be a virtue about that. Uh, it's a very evocative, but there's also some, some dangers around that, too. And a lot of times the copycats are really just kind of superficial similarities in that tone and that style, uh, how, like, salty Nietzsche is about so much stuff um, that you, you see people kind of expressing views that are in that are similar and in a similar style and way but very few of them have um, as much merit and and reward a deeper study uh, that Nietzsche does um, so and this is all kind of given uh, this is me as someone who like doesn't sympathize with a lot of Nietzsche's conclusions um, I, I, if we had more time, I could do this in a much more careful and exhaustive sort of way. But maybe in terms of TLDR sorts of stuff, if you ask me from my all the time I've spent working with Nietzsche and studying him and trying to understand him, Nietzsche's figure is somewhat of a tragic figure to me. That's the, that's the sort of person who has emerged from my study with him. I think of Nietzsche as very much like a poet. He's very sensitive and very empathetic. A, one of the, the best things about studying Nietzsche is how, how um, sensitive he is as an observer of human nature and what humans are up to. He's really good at seeing through all the smoke and mirrors games that people have around their how they present them, posture, and pre yeah, present an image of themselves to others and what's kind of going on underneath the surface, kind of almost psychoanalytically. I mean, he's he calls himself a uh, treasure hunter. Like, he, like, digs underground. So he doesn't just look at things on the surface level and engage with them as just for the rational proposals that they are, but he's always digging to the underlying motives and drives. We might talk about drives a little bit today. The drives that are behind, that give expression to these rational ideas. And that's where he wants to do this kind of penetrating analysis. And a lot of the observations that he makes, I think, are are useful as sort of like raw material to be considering. Whether you use them as a basis for arguing for the kinds of conclusions that Nietzsche goes with, I don't know so much. And that, that's part of the tragedy of Nietzsche's figure to me, that he's a very sensitive person, 
he's got very high ideals um, and he picks up on all of the signals of like what's going on in the noise of humans but he kind of it, it, it's I don't know like it, it causes him to become very cynical and jaded and angry and frustrated and bitter and actually a lot of the things that he uh, bemoans in humanity I think are actually somewhat reflected in him himself um, he has a lot of criticism of what he calls resentment this like essential posture or attitude of resentment toward reality and self-hate and all this kind of stuff that he thinks is a big part of what humanity has evolved into uh, that he wants to kind of correct or overcome <clears throat> that's part of um, his sort of positive ethical project but I think it, it it's sort of like the the intense sensitivity that he picks up on um, causes him to sacrifice some other values and ideals and become way more fixated on power stuff and I, I'm not saying like we should just dismiss Nietzsche out of hand maybe some of you in reading him are like ah, I really like <clears throat> what this guy's throwing down I think he's on the money and Tim you're wrong to criticize him for this stuff actually this is pretty legit stuff and I've met plenty of Nietzsche scholars and people who have been enthusiastic about Nietzsche's ideas and I, I can see the um, can see the grounds of the plausible merit of, of what he's throwing down but we just have to think really really critically about it um, so regardless of whether you agree or disagree with my take on Nietzsche or what I would evaluate in him the thing that I always encourage in reading Nietzsche is to be careful if you do find yourself and I imagine some of you in this class every time I've taught this I've seen students on both both ends of the spectrum and everywhere in between some people might have read him and been like man I really like this this makes a lot of sense I like the cut of this guy's jib um, and if you're in that kind of boat um, my advice is read critically <laughs> look for really really put the screws to Nietzsche's argument don't just uh, kind of fall for the rhetoric Nietzsche is really good at being able to make an idea look good and whether it actually is good needs it needs to be cashed out and be like what what's really the argument here what are, what are the premises that this depends on are those legit do they if they're true do they actually justify the kinds of conclusions that Nietzsche draws from them um, kind of put the critical screws to Nietzsche if you're on the side though and you might be you're like this guy's bullshit I hated this <laughs> I've had many students be like very unapologetic of like this guy's trash and I don't even know why you assigned this reading. Um, why would you even engage with this guy? This is just toxic crap. Um, if you're on that side, then my advice is always charity. To like look at what what is legit in here. What what is going on? Where does Nietzsche's got some points? And even if they're ultimately wrong, they can be really useful to spend the time trying to respond to. And that's that's probably the number one place in which studying Nietzsche's brought me some benefit as a philosopher Nietzsche gives arguments that you just don't hear as often they're much less represented um, his intense critique of traditional morality and justice things that I'm a big fan of like Buddhism and Christianity and egalitarianism Nietzsche challenges all that stuff and asks for a defense of things that we don't usually we're not usually asked to defend and in figuring out how to uh, respond to Nietzsche's challenges and his objections and give satisfying responses to his concerns can teach a lot about why the things that we think are right are right I kinda talked about this I think I even brought up Nietzsche when we did um, the acceptability principle from the code of intellectual conduct way back at the beginning of the quarter and my main point was that even if you think an opposing an op a possible opponent is wrong and if you have a debate with them you're not confident that you're, you're not thinking the probability is very high that they're going to be able to convince you to change your mind on something like when I go to Nietzsche Nietzsche's like yeah most people aren't worth anything and you don't have any moral obligations toward them in terms of justice or compassion or anything else I'm like yeah I don't think you're gonna be able to convince me that I'm wrong about that Nietzsche but even if that is the case there can still be purpose there can still be something productive that comes out of grappling with them dialectically getting into the debate um, Nietzsche helped me um, sort of strip away some arguments for positions that 
he criticizes that are weak, that aren't going to withstand scrutiny, but he also kind of helped foment what are the really much more stronger arguments that really do justify it. Kind of like a um, trial by fire or like tempering a blade or something, right? You, you put it into a challenge space, you run it through a gauntlet, and then what survives at the other end is maybe much stronger, more legitimate. So that can be really be helpful. Nietzsche taught me a lot about just exactly w why I'm so committed. Uh, what were the reasons? What are the justifications for having the values that I do um, in sort of having this thing to bounce off against? So I hope this is making sense. Um, how, how many is this making sense to people? I, I don't even know how many of you actually did the reading, <laughs> so like have some background for you know some context of all the things I'm saying about Nietzsche. Um, but is this making sense? Do you have any questions or comments about? It? Mm hmm It's making sense? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I need someone like Nietzsche always stands in need of defense. As Nietzsche says in this whole whole reading, he says when he's talking about the madmen, remember the aphorism about the madmen, and Nietzsche kind of identifies as one of these madmen. Um, he's like, we always stand in need of defense. We're the ones that are like shaking the consensus of society. Um, we always look dangerous. We always uh, look chaotic and need defense. Um, and I think he's right about that, <laughs> if he's going to be relevant at all. Um, Fernandez said, yeah, I couldn't tell if he was being sarcastic about things or really understand a lot of what he was talking about. So yeah, let, let's, let's, uh, I'll, I'll use this as an opportunity to to talk about this tangent. Um, I, I think a lot of what we're going to be able to accomplish in one day with Nietzsche is really just about how to approach him. Um, so if you spend more time with the Nietzsche readings, they're they're up on Canvas, you've got access to them. Um, if you want to read them on your own after the quarter is over and you know talk about it with me, I would love that. If you actually do read Nietzsche after the quarter is over, I would actually request, please get in contact with me because I think Nietzsche is someone you definitely want to be studying with other people and and bouncing off your ideas and reactions is a part of that critical project because it's so important to read him in a responsible way there are some dangerous ideas in here and and I even wonder about whether I even want to teach it but anyway <laughs> if you do want to do more after class please by all means get a hold of me um, but we can I can sort of talk about some of the framing things about if you were gonna do that like how, how would you pursue spending more time with Nietzsche so one big thing is that Nietzsche does not always believe, or he doesn't really sub, uh, subscribe to, positions he explicitly claims or identifies. So that's part of the sneakiness here. Um, you might have noticed just in the part one of Gay Science, this book, Gay Science, that I'm giving you readings from uh, for our treatment of Nietzsche, that he sort of seems to contradict himself in certain places. Whenever you see that, that should send up some red flags, that whatever Nietzsche believes here is maybe can't just be taken word for word literally right off the page, that there might be some false signals involved, or you know, think, like, what is he really getting at in this section? And what's he really getting at at this section? They appear to contradict each other, but what's sort of the, what's the underlying thing that I could attribute to Nietzsche's perspective that would make both of these comments or things that he's going off about in these two sections compatible. So take his criticism of the realists in contrast with the madmen, the poet people. There's kind of like these two figures that Nietzsche is describing that we're, that humanity is always kind of like ping-ponging between. In other readings he refers to them as the Dionysian and the Apollonian. There's like the rational science type truth seeker people like uh, what philosophy has to a large part been defined by. And then you've got these poets or chaotic people that don't hold to particular like rational forms of life. Um, they don't care about consistency. They're really driven by passions and life vitality more than truth. Right? So there's these kind of two sides. The, or you hear in this reading the tragedy and the comedy these kind of two sides. And in those two passages, Nietzsche's got like massive criticism for both of them. 
<laughs> it's like, really, he's got like an, it seems like he has an axe to grind for one or the other. But you couldn't say, oh, he's criticizing this one so heavily, so therefore he's on the other side. And then he criticized this one, and he's not on the other side. So what is his real position here? And he does have a real position in gay science, but you have to kind of read between the lines to figure it out a lot. The other thing that's going on here is that Nietzsche is not interested in convincing everybody. That there's actually just, a, he's, he's an elitist. He does not believe in equal value of everybody. And this is a my, this is one of the biggest reasons I can't be down with his project, is the way in which it has these sorts of implications. But Nietzsche is trying to really speak to a very select audience. So he's trying to, see, sometimes, like a troll, he's trying to provoke people just arbitrarily. To, he, he actually wants people, a certain, he wants certain people not reading his books. So he's intentionally offensive. To like mm -hmm. try to convince people to dismiss him, because he doesn't want to be understood by everybody. So that's that's a, another real big thing that you should be like, okay, I really got to be on my guard with what's going on here. Like what what is like when you're when Vernadette you're saying couldn't tell if he was being sarcastic. There is such heavy sarcasm going on all the time, but it's not always clear what is the point of the sarcasm. Nietzsche is, uses a lot of this kind of exaggerated rhetoric, but trying to figure out like what's his game. What is his mm -hmm. ambition here? Um, it can it can be really it can put you into a paranoid state of mind trying to read Nietzsche and interpret him and figure out what's really going on. I know it's from firsthand experience, <laughs> but I do think it's worth the struggle that there's a lot of stuff to get out of here. And you don't have to. It's not a matter of like whether you sign up and drink the Kool Aid or dismiss the whole thing entirely. Um, people oftentimes wrong positions can have points of insight in them. That can happen. And, and I think a lot of studying Nietzsche is about trying to sift through all the bullshit and find the little nuggets of like something that's actually kind of interesting and good. Um, maybe by the end of uh, today's lecture, if you're interested, I can share something from Nietzsche that I think is actually somewhat legitimate or like has been influential. Um, it's not all just about here's why he's wrong sort of things. Um, but a really good example of this duplicity that you've got to be on guard against is way at the beginning of the reading. I think it's aphorism two here. I can actually pull it up for you. Um, if you've got the reading with you and you want to follow along, it's going to be up here on the recording for people on YouTube later. Um, but here, oh, it's not behaving. Come on. Do you people have the reading in front of them? You you'd be able to. I'll, I'll just read it to you. Um, here. Okay. Oops, that's too far. Oh, actually, you know, in aphorism one, there's a really good example of how you, you have to be careful. Yeah, the intellectual conscience stuff. Um, you have to be really careful with how you're reading Nietzsche. You know, this part about the teachers and the purpose of existence, when he says... Um, even the most harmful person may actually be the most useful when it comes to the preservation of the species. For he nurtures in himself or through his effects on others drives without which humanity would long since have become feeble or rotten. Hatred, delight in the misfortunes of others, the lust to rob and rule, and whatever else is called evil, all belong to the amazing economy of the preservation of the species. An economy which is certainly costly, wasteful, and on the whole most foolish but still proven to have preserved our race so far. Now, what Nietzsche is saying is that when we, that we have to be careful about dividing up people in society in terms of helpful and harmful, that our, our uh, evolutionary story is much more complicated than this. And he's really talking about social evolution here, not just biological uh, genetic evolution, but sort of the idea of where memes came from. Like this idea of cultural elements that work their way into our societies and into our thinking that then get perpetuated and um, transmitted between us and stick around. And Nietzsche is saying there are some things that have been uh, like ideas and impulses and values and motivations that contribute to the preservation of the species. Um, but this does not mean that Nietzsche is endorsing this. He's not saying that this is good. He actually says it's certainly costly, wasteful, and on the whole, most foolish. Most of the rest of the book is about 
trying to do something different, how to do something better. But it might might look at the surface level like he's sort of endorsing that or saying that it's good. Nietzsche is not an evolutionary ethicist. He is not a social Darwinist, if you've ever heard of that position. He's not saying people that are stronger uh, you know, in this fight for survival deserve to survive or are somehow better or something like that. Uh, but it can it can definitely give that impression. But here's the passage I was thinking about from Aphorism 2 on intellectual conscience um, that is a good example of, of just how manipulative Nietzsche can be and how you have to be really careful in reading him. So he says, um, I can't, I keep having the same experience and keep resisting it anew each time. I do not want to believe it, although I can grasp it as with my hands. What is this idea? that the great majority lacks an intellectual conscience. Indeed, it has often seemed to me as if someone requiring such a conscience would be as lonely in the most densely populated cities as he would be in the desert. Everyone looks at you with strange eyes and goes on handling their scales, calling this good and that evil. Nobody as much as blushes when you notice that their weights are underweight, nor do they become indignant with you. Perhaps they laugh at your doubts. I mean, to the great majority of people, it is not contemptible to believe this or that and to live accordingly without first becoming aware of the final and most certain reasons pro and con and without even troubling themselves about such reasons afterwards. The most gifted men and the noblest women still belong to this great majority. So what's going on here? I mean, Nietzsche is hes talking about the importance of critical thinking. And that, that's what an intellectual conscience is like some kind of sensitivity or awareness that you could be wrong or that you need to test your ideas and beliefs and values and lifestyle before being willing to act on it. When he's talking about the weights being underweight and this kind of thing, he's like, the, most people don't go through this rigorous procedure um, and they really ought to. And he says, for anybody who is concerned about that, it's very lonely. Like no one, no one wants to engage with you about this. Um, or as much as blushes when they, you expose their mistakes on that. Uh, they just kind of go on doing their own thing. Now, notice, that, and that's a fine point, right? You know, what philosopher is going to, to, to say that having an intellectual conscience isn't a good thing? To have some kind of critical accountability for our beliefs is kind of a whole part of, about being a truth seeker. But notice how Nietzsche does it, how he presents this idea. It's really a posturing. He's like, you and me, we get it, right? All these people are idiots, right? Don't you feel so alone? Like no one else gets it? I get you. I see you. Right? He, he already is putting you into this posture where you want to see yourself as aligned with him. He's, he's kind of roping you in. It's a very classic manipulative technique that many people have used, even like cult leaders and stuff like this, right? Um, as a, a way to set you and the other person on the same side opposed to all these other people or problems or whatever, right? Um, Nietzsche's got all this like criticism for these people who are irresponsible and you're like, well, I, I, I'm not one of those people. I'm, I'm with you, Nietzsche, right? So it, it's, the, it's the subtle rhetorical ways in which Nietzsche frames a lot of his points, which might be otherwise legitimate. Like, I don't have a problem with you know, extolling the virtues of an intellectual conscience or holding yourself accountable to your beliefs and, and even recognizing that all too often this doesn't happen in the world and it really should happen more and that people can be incredibly gifted um, and intelligent and still not be doing that, right? Not uh, approaching life with this kind of critical intellectual conscience. I can accept all of that and still be really worried about how Nietzsche decides to capture this point, especially early on in the book. Um, he gets this like uh, sympathy for for certain parts of the audience that ends up giving him what appears to be greater legitimacy. The other thing that I like to point out about this passage is look at the way in which um, Nietzsche talks a big game here about an intellectual conscience, and then just notice how infrequently he really seems to subject himself to those same standards. He just kind of speaks about stuff, and you're like. Okay, you've painted a nice picture, Nietzsche. Why should I buy this picture? What is the actual basis of argument for it? And it doesn't always happen. And Nietzsche doesn't always present 
very charitably almost ever his opponents for what they have to say to challenge the way that he's talking about things i mean a lot of nietzsche is kind of a rant kind of like a blog rant it's a very it's a blog rant written by someone who's a very gifted author and poet and who has some real ideas that he's packing under the hood in terms of the positions that he's presenting um it, but Nietzsche is really adept at painting a very nice looking vision, but whether it is really the most rationally defensible and what are the weak spots of that position or that perspective, he's definitely not shouldering all the responsibility that I've asked you to shoulder in your paper projects to like explicitly identify where objections could be coming from and to res try to respond to them as charitably but as reasonably as possible. Um, definitely Nietzsche is not a role model here, in my opinion, for what doing good philosophical work looks like. Uh, it should be done more transparently and with some more self-accountability um, and, mm -hmm. and not just yeah. rhetoric, leaning on rhetoric as being the basis of persuasion. So these are things to watch out for with Nietzsche. Um, so that's some, some big picture stuff. Um, there's a lot I could share about where Nietzsche is coming from on a whole host of matters we could talk about um we could talk more about nietzsche's attitude about morality we could talk more about the problem of gay science um that he's sort of setting up in this whole paper or this whole book um we could talk about nietzsche's drive psychology which is something i actually think is that's one of the more legitimate parts of what he has got going on or at least it's got an interesting position to to offer um what but what kind of stuff are you interested in here too so, Bernadette, I think we ended up talking a little bit about uh, what you were wondering about before, about um, the pro and cons and the the uncertainty. I mean, this is really just about having an intellectual conscience. But in terms of the higher and lower beings, I could talk about that if you're curious, too. But please, please, people, drop some stuff in the chat so we can use this time productively. Is that, yeah, um, this was the section you were talking about? There's a lot of cool stuff in part two as well. I, I split it up into two parts. These are all hand-picked selections from the book um, based on sort of a movement of framing a problem and then talking about possible solutions. So the second half gets more of Nietzsche's positive project. The first half is sort of like his negative project. Um, I think discussing drives would be interesting if we have time. Yeah, I can do that. Any any other votes or things that people are interested in that you could throw on my radar? I could try to weave some of these things together. Nietzsche's kind of got this, all these ideas all over the place, but they kind of all fit together too. Okay. Michael and Bernadette seem to be the people active in chat today. <laughs> um, anyone else want to want to throw something in the mix here? Really wish we were in person for this. This is from a different piece of Nietzsche's writing, but he also explored existentialism, right? The whole the whole stuff is existentialism, and Nietzsche is an existentialist. What existentialism means is, I mean, it's a very broad term for what's kind of a narrow group of philosophers that get categorized under it. Um, and there is no category of philosophy or philosophers like the existentialist label in terms of just how diverse their views are. You get everything from Nietzsche who like absolutely loathes anything that has to do with religion. And then you've got guys like Kierkegaard who are just straight up religious philosophers. I mean, there's a really weird mix of things. There's people who are super egalitarian, people who are definitely not like Nietzsche, people who find rationality to be a really core part of, of authenticity and people who are completely opposed to it. I mean, they're just, the existentialists are all over the place. If there is one thing that is sort of the common thread between them, I'd say it's a major concern about authenticity. What is it to be an authentic person? 
and that is reflected in this book. Um, the the kind of core theme, especially getting into part two, where Nietzsche is offering some something like a proposal or a theory. His main thing that he wants to pursue is honesty. How can we move forward and be honest with ourselves about it? How can humanity evolve um, without telling a lie about itself? That's what Nietzsche thinks happened in the history of philosophy. That in terms of adapting to becoming true seekers, to do philosophy, to be critical, required us to tell a lie about ourselves. Namely, that we are not ruled by our drives and ruled by our reason. And Nietzsche thinks that's a lie. So that I can tie this in with um, the drive stuff. So Nietzsche's drive psychology. So Nietzsche thinks that everything about us is ultimately drives. What you are is a collection of drives. Um, and everything about you is a drive. And all drives have the same kind of core engine inside of them. And that's what Nietzsche calls will to power. So every drive, uh, drives are just like motives or instincts. They're, they're, uh, they have objects of value. There's something that they pursue. And a drive can be for something as specific as, I don't know, alcohol or cheeseburgers or something, um, or jogging, or something really abstract like truth-seeking, or justice, or love, or you know, really big picture things or big picture dynamics um, and everything in between. But every drive is going to have this like core instinct or motive, some kind of object that it's trying to get at. And then it also has will to power. So it wants to expand itself. It wants to, if, it, if you're, we're talking on the scope of an individual person, it's like a motive in you or a desire that wants to rule your entire life that it becomes your ultimate concern, that everything about your life revolves around this, this motive, this drive, right? Um, getting this to happen. Everything else is then ancillary and focused in terms or contextualized by that master drive which rules over all of your decision making and all of your meaning making in your life. So it could be on the level of an individual or on the level of like say the entire human race. <laughs> So if it's like a, a drive, like a meme, something, uh, an idea uh, or an instinct that then gets perpetuated further, um, all drives want to just take over more and more of reality and bend it, bend all perception and judgment around that drive. So it's it's kind of like obsession, right? Like when a single drive ends up overriding everything else, or like that happens in addiction. Um, like say with alcoholism where everything else gets sacrificed on the altar of the addiction that's the main thing that's the thing that matters above all else um, so all drives have this Nietzsche thing so I can kind of draw it almost like a uh, like in a picture of an atom or a molecule or something like that the core the nucleus is pure arbitrary motives an instinct no reason involved it's just like you want this because you want it completely arbitrary but then a drive will project out a shell and that shell is like rational judgments perceptions evidence all these other basically excuses or rationalizations for the legitimacy of that core drive um, so it's like a, a propaganda campaign every drive inside of yourself or in the rest of society at the macro level everything is sort of um, trying to gain more power and influence by bending reality toward it, right? Toward promoting its acting on that drive. Um, drives, uh, I like using an individual as just an example here, like an individual person, because Nietzsche does this a lot too. But he sort of, um, you think about how drives get stronger or weaker. What's the food that makes them grow? Um, it's experiences. So when you have experiences, um, they don't kind of operate at face value necessarily. They have to be interpreted. And interpreted with which lens, right? So each drive has its own lens by which it might um, tell a story about whatever happened to you. Nietzsche uses the example of walking down the street 
and as you pass by someone they start laughing well how do you interpret what happened there are they laughing at you are they amused by you are they critical of you are they being judgmental of you like what is going on how you interpret it is a sign of like what drives rule you in your psychology um, what how you're going to approach things so the more that you have experiences that are interpreted in the way that that drive is projecting an image of reality it gets stronger or every time you make a decision based on that drive as opposed to the other ones it gets stronger so this this kind of rationalizing shell imagine like a sea anemone that it's got its little tentacles going out to capture food particles if it can tell a story where it gets more attention or it's given more credence or more support of more relevancy in your life that's how it gains food to get stronger and it wants to hide behind justification to tell a lie about itself based this is part of the propaganda of it that it as if it isn't arbitrary as if it the drive itself has some objective basis of authority or legitimacy that's part of the story that it tells about itself to try to get more power to try to get more influence in you or in humanity at large in this kind of ecology of ideas and motives that is out there the the marketplace of ideas kind of thing a little bit um, so that's Nietzsche's theory about drives and it's really um, in stark contrast with something like um, the not even the Enlightenment like the platonic sort of framework or mentality that reason is something that makes us different that or gives us the power to be self-determining in spite of our instincts or feelings or motives that we're able to expose the arbitrariness of our motives and then also present the opportunity of building desires and motives accountable to some kind of independent rational standards of objectivity All right so Nietzsche's Nietzsche's proposal is just totally dismantling the enlightenment or at least attempting to do so I'm not sure he's successful at this but this is this is his perspective is this making some sense uh, at least my description of what Nietzsche's got going on with drives is this reading to those of you in the chat sort of yeah mm hmm think so yeah this is a, somewhat of a complicated idea Nietzsche thinks about uh, he uses a metaphor some in some other writings about how a person is like a garden and it's a garden of all these different plants and the plants are like your drives and they're all competing for sunlight right they need food and when you don't give them attention they wither up and die so if you're not using a drive as part of your interpretive lens on reality or that you're acting on for making decisions, then it doesn't get food and it, it'll wither and die. And the ones that do get the food grow and are stronger. But they also can live in kind of symbiotic relationship with each other. Um, Nietzsche talks about how there can be these master-slave relationships between drives, that a drive could accept that it's a lower priority than some master drive but sort of gain food kind of like a symbiotic relationship here um, the master drive wants to incorporate the other drives because it feeds more attention toward that drive it gets more power and strength but it also gets colored by all of the drives that serve it um, they're all going to contribute their own like flavor to how this main drive is understood um, so there, there can be these nested relationships of like a hierarchy of what drives take more priority in you but Nietzsche also talks I think this is in the part two there's an aphorism about this we it's the aphorism that starts one thing is needful to give style to one's character that's what Nietzsche says and uh, he says I don't care whether your taste is good or bad what matters is that you have a taste so Nietzsche talks about uh, Bernadette you were wondering about higher and lower beings one of the main ways that Nietzsche defines the distinction here between basically people who have value and most people who don't which I again for the record completely disagree with I think he's wrong about this uh, in terms of his like elitism but part of his virtue values that he's setting up of like what we, what's stronger what's weaker is about how someone deals with their garden he says it's weaker natures that just want to let the garden go wild they don't want to prune it 
They don't want to be intentional about crafting their character. They just want to give free reign to their desires and let them do whatever they want. Free nature. That's their conception of freedom. And Nietzsche thinks that's not freedom. <laughs> that he, he does, he's actually kind of traditional in this. He's more like Plato or Kant in that he thinks real freedom is a matter of being self-determining. So it's strong natures, Nietzsche thinks, who have passion, because it's not going to be on reason for Nietzsche, but um, have a passion for cultivating their garden intentionally, like being very selective, kind of like, um, I don't know if you've ever been to Japanese gardens. There's a really beautiful one in Portland where I grew up that's actually designed by the, um, the guy who did uh, uh, King Kokuji in Japan, the like uh, famous Buddhist temple. It's all made out of gold. And there's a beautiful Japanese garden around it. Um, but the traditional design philosophy is you might try to make things look natural, but everything is very carefully cultivated. And you don't just let things go wild in some big jungle. Um, everything is very meticulously planned. Like the, if you were walking around a Japanese garden, ev from every place that you set foot on the path, if you look in all directions, it's like it's a composed painting they, like the your perspective has this compositional beauty um, and aesthetics to it um, so everything is super deliberate that kind of gardening is what Nietzsche is talking about when he's talking about a strong nature so they they see freedom in holding their character accountable in constraining it and making it play with some kind of vision rather than just letting it run wild so that's, uh, that's one um, distinction about the higher and lower beings, and that's a, it's a really big thing for Nietzsche, the difference between... And, that, and that's why the critical component, I think, is, like when he's talking about the intellectual conscience, this isn't what we might, as if we're not Nietzscheans, say about it, or what most philosophers would say about it, but its importance for Nietzsche has more to do with an exertion of your own will to power, that you are subjecting your own self, your own psychology and character to your own will rather than hands off, hands off the wheel about it. Yeah, being intentional. Yeah. But Nietzsche's worried about the thing you were saying earlier about how he thinks we many much of humanity's development is proceeded under a kind of lie that we've had to pretend like we're not beings with drives that we are like we have control of ourselves through reason in order to attempt projects like this like intentional living and Nietzsche's like is it possible for us to be honest that what we really are is just drives and and still be able to do something like true seeking I mean that's that's the question of the gay science um, just so I know I'm over time here but since this is the only time I'm going to get a hold of you for Nietzsche, I'll just leave you with one, one last idea as a framing thing for if you want to go on and do more of these readings. Um, the Gay Science itself is a very, very interesting book. It's not the usual, this is not the first choice that most uh, 101 classes that bring in Nietzsche would even do. They probably would do Genealogy of Morals or Beyond Good and Evil. These are the more famous books by Nietzsche. But as someone who's like studied him a lot, I was like, gay science is the best introduction. For one thing, it's like Nietzsche's happy period. I mean, if you thought he was dark in this one, just try reading his other stuff. It's pretty, gets pretty, pretty nasty, pretty toxic in the, the rhetorical style and everything. This one's a little bit more hopeful, but it also has like all of Nietzsche's ideas from his younger period and some foreshadowing of his ideas in his later periods. They're all, they all kind of are in this nexus of gay science. I think it's one of the best introductions to Nietzsche's thought for all the diverse things that he's got going on. Um, but the big question of the gay science is this. Nietzsche thinks in the story of humanity's existence on the planet that we start rooted in just pure drives, life vital drives, how to survive, um, but also how to have a spirit of survival how to have joy with life, to be invested in life, to work at life in order to, I mean, you're not going to survive if you don't work at it, right? So some kind of life vitality, some enthusiasm for life. This is the gay part of gay science, the joy of living. And it's very arbitrary. Nietzsche thinks it's completely rooted in error. There's no reason to think that being rational is going to be, to give you a survival advantage. And I think he's kind of right about this. Uh, he foreshadowed a lot of uh, misconceptions about evolutionary theory that are 
that have developed since his time. Um, but anyway, um, that's that's where our story begins. And then Nietzsche says, ancient Gre he's actually a classicist by trade. He studies ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, culture, history. Uh, that's where he started his training um, as an intellectual. And so he studied a lot of the pre-Socratics, like the, the, the philosophers that came before Socrates. And he thinks in that period of time, something changed where humanity didn't just go with the basic errors of our instincts um, from our, our evolutionary heritage from time immemorial, as he puts it, but some, there's some new thing that happens where we start getting concerned about truth. We start playing a different kind of game. We start questioning or having skepticism for the old instincts and dogmas that we just spontaneously believe unreflectively, that were a part of what allowed us to have survival advantages. We start rethinking things and thinking critically. But it involved that lie of pretending that we are really rational beings, like Aristotle defines humans as the rational animal, right? There, we got instincts, but we also have this rational faculty that lets us hold that stuff in check or to be intentional. And Nietzsche thinks that's a lie. And it's a lie that has cost us that over the rest of humanity's evolution and development since this time, basically the entire ancient world all the way leading up to our, our contemporary world today, that there's been this deep tension in human nature between the, the old instincts and desire for life vital joy and truth seeking and accountability and skepticism and the science part, so gay science, right, this combo together. Um, and how do they get those things, they, he says, the, you know, the truth seeking stuff was very weak to begin with. It was all about life vitality, but it gets, gets stronger and stronger and now they're clashing. And two, they, can they be reconciled with one another? Is it, a, is it possible to have gay science? Can this happen? Joyful truth seeking, can that occur? How would that happen? Nietzsche thinks we might have to be really different. And really what gay science is about is experimenting with human life and how our drives and everything could be radically redesigned. It's almost kind of transhumanistic, but on a spiritual character, psychological kind of level about like how those drives could be rearranged in a way that's not just us playing out the same momentum of unplanned spontaneity that's happened for our entire evolutionary history. Um, so that's a that's a little bit of a framing for for what Nietzsche's doing here. Um, the whole oh I need to give you a code word too. Um, let's just do drives. Drives is the code word for today. Um, I'll just make it easy. Um, but uh, the, all the stuff about tragedy and comedy is in the same wheelhouse of this this dichotomy that Nietzsche is playing with throughout the book. Um, that there's part of us that has this drive. Yeah, that's right. Um, Part of us has this drive for just having fun and breaking the rules and not holding ourselves accountable and just free nature. And then there's another part of us that's drawn toward tragedy, like life is serious. This is all stuff that shows up in the first aphorism, that there's – it matters, man. Like the truth matters. Justice matters. There's meaning to life. There's something going on here to pay attention to. And you just can't just do whatever you want. And Nietzsche talks about how we jump back and forth between which part of that we are giving authority to or ruling in ourselves at any given time. And then we just kind of flip-flop back and forth. Like you go partying for a long time and then you get sick of partying because there's no – it's really empty and superficial. And so you're like, I need to do something to better myself. And then you work on investing into something. But then that investment and that paradigm becomes a cage and there's rules and you're like, I'm sick of this and I need to – burn it all down or get detached from it and go back to being free again, you know, and this just sort of ping pong back and forth. And Nietzsche's like, is there a better way? Is there some way in which these competing aspects of our natures can be combined um, in a way that isn't inauthentic, right? Bernadette says, something to, re to really think about with our lifestyle change and trying to find the joy in staying at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there's some constraints that are forced onto us under these circumstances if we're going to be responsible. I mean, as, as I've mentioned before, one of the things that has been very inspiring about this whole time is that um, for not everybody, but for a lot of people, the choice of being careful and prudent is not just about your own self-interest and protecting your own health, but protecting the health of other people. 
And uh, so, yeah, you can do that for, with authenticity and joy versus just like, oh, it's a moral obligation as wearing me down. This guy, there's some stuff about that in Nietzsche for sure. There's so much more. I mean, normally we do Nietzsche over a week. So for me to just give something, yeah, I know, you guys got to go. Uh, thanks for sticking around. Um, I hope this has been something. <laughs> it's very short introduction to Nietzsche. Um, I do encourage you to take a look at the readings and spend more time with Nietzsche, maybe after the quarter is over. And by all means, if you do, please get in contact with me. I'd love to talk to you about it and see what you're getting out of it and what you're thinking you agree with, disagree with, just wrestling with, with the territory. You're welcome. Thanks. I hope to see you on Friday. Take care. Good luck with everything. Let me know how I can help this week. Bye-bye.